Welcome back to Ask the Compound, where I think we have one of the most intelligent audiences in all of financial entertainment. The people who ask the more in-depth questions have always done their homework. The people who ask more general questions seem to always be on the right path. So I like that we get a kind of mix of the two. We're going to talk about a mix of those two today. Remember, if you have an email, have a question for us, email us askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. Today, we are sponsored by our friends at Bird Dogs. One of the things I like to do in the summer, I like to be a little active. So I take the kids on a bike ride once or twice a weekend. And I like to be both stylish and comfortable because I'm riding the bike. And I still have one of my little ones on the back with me on those little trailer bikes, you know. You hook it up to the back, it's, so I got like three wheels. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of the work. She pedals sometimes. But I'm, but, so I have, to be, I have to have some movement. The bird dogs give me some movement. They're stretchy. They're nice. But then when I get there, I look good as well. So I love the fact that you can do a little bit of both. Look good. I had a friend last week. So what, do you, what are those shorts? I said, oh, come on. These are bird dogs. Get yourself a pair. So I think I talked them into them. Remember, if you go to birddog.com slash ATC, you get one of these free tumblers, which is kind of nice. You got one, I, too? I, I remember mine today. Do we still have to use the, the code to get it or not? No code. Just no code. the URL now, slash right. ATC. That does it. Screaming deal. All right, let's do a question. Yep. Okay, up first today, we have, I'm in my mid-30s, and my business has done very well over the past three years. I'm trying to decide what to do with the savings I've stacked away in a high-yield savings account. I was planning to pay off my $150,000 student loans and invest the rest, or I could pay off my $500,000 3% mortgage, but I can't do both. I'm weighing my options here while considering that a recession could significantly reduce my income. Which option is going to give me the biggest nest egg in retirement? Pay off my mortgage and use my mortgage payment for investments, pay off my student loans and dollar cost average into investments, keep my mortgage, make monthly loan payments, and DCA dollar cost average into investments. Now, I feel like we're kicking this off with a not to brag today, but do the six figures in student loans also counteract the not to brag and make yeah, it yeah, that, a little yeah. bit, right? Yeah. Uh, However, it means that maybe they're pretty highly educated. So maybe that's I mean, it, a form of not to brag. It sounds to me like the student loans were a pretty good investment. So let's go through each. We've got three options here. Let's go through one by one. So pay off the mortgage and use mortgage payments for investments. I don't like this one one bit. I'm anti pay off 3% mortgage. I have been for a while. I just see no reason to get rid of that when inflation is so high, interest rates are so high. I mean, yes, it would free up monthly payments, but why would you decrease your liquidity, especially if you're worried about what a recession might do to your business for variable income? Plus, that 3% mortgage is currently below probably what you're earning in your online savings account. Put that in T-bills, you're talking about 5%. I mean, that's you're essentially paying for your mortgage if you're doing that, and you have some left over. So I think either one of those options, I, just, I don't like paying off the 3% mortgage. It makes no sense. Uh, I, I mean, I just... Over my dead body, I'm letting go of this 3%. I wish I could like extend it to like 90 years and just never pay it off. So, um, I mean, you could dollar cost average into the market, but why would you do that with your monthly payments and not just do it with the cash? So the next one is pay off the student loans, but then you have some more money. I guess if, if this person can pay off their 500 k mortgage, they have a decent amount of money saved up. So you pay off the student loans and then you DCA. I, this one depends on your rate for student loans. Are they more than, say, I don't know, 5%? At that level, maybe it makes some sense to pay them all off. If they're below 5%, I think I might hold off a little bit unless that debt makes you just violently ill. I just don't see the rush when interest rates are so high and inflation is so high. The third one is keep the mortgage, make the payments, DCA into investment, right? Keep, keep all the debt. If you're, if you're okay keeping the debt, this probably makes the most sense with a caveat. Like you mentioned, the potential recession could reduce your income. So I think if you're in a cyclical business with a variable income like this, maybe increase your, your margin of safety and have a little bit more an emergency fund. That, so I'd keep a cash cushion, potentially. Uh, but there's another option, too, where you don't have to make one big decision with the money. There's no one forcing a gun, with a gun to your head saying, you have to do this. Pick one, two, or three, door one, two, or three, right? Uh, you could pay off a, a small chunk of your student loans. You could set aside some money for an emergency fund. You, you could even do a small lump sum into the stock market and then dollar cost average the rest. So you don't have to make one choice. You could kind of diversify your options, which, which helps minimize the regret, I think. But I don't know. It sounds like you're in a pretty good place to me. And if the, the, the yields on those loans or the interest rates on those loans are still pretty low, as long as you're okay holding the debt, I see no problem holding that for a while. And then you can always pay it off in the future as well. You don't have to make a rush decision now. Right. Yeah, and they, they mentioned that, you know, given the current environment for student loans, but yeah, that's we don't really know what the future holds, so it's hard to, to bank on. Yeah, they kind of said people, have, you know, the government's been pretty, you know, liberal with student loans lately and, and payments. And yeah, I, I, I don't think there's a rush to do that, but especially the 3% mortgage when, when T-bill yields are higher than that, that just, I don't see how that ever makes sense in, in today's environment. 
Yeah. And so as far as debt goes in general, what what is your your number of like where where you draw that line? Well, T bill yields are five percent right now, right? That's okay. a pretty good place to start, I would think. Right? Yeah, because that's that that's your hurdle rate. Cool. Let's do another one. That question's from uh Zachariah, by the way. So up next we have a question from Casey, who I recognize from social media or the chat or or, or somewhere. But uh so Casey writes What's the incentive uh, here to buy AAA corporate debt versus just buying U.S. Treasuries that are yielding slightly higher and are risk-free? Is this normal? Casey, a very astute member of our audience here. No, this is definitely not normal. John, do a chart on. I have good data for, for the Federal Reserve on AAA-rated corporate debt and three-month T-bills going back to 1934. So the average spread of AAA corporate bond yields over T-bills is 2.4%. We've had T-bill yields higher than corporate bonds before, but it only happened in the early 80s and the 1970s, which makes sense. Like now, inflation was much higher, interest rates were rising. Um, however, this is very rare to see this. So there's almost 1,100 months in this data. These are month-end data from the Fed. Uh, I've, by my calculation, 33 of those months saw T-bill yields greater than corporate bond yields. So we're talking like 3% of the time. This is, this is very rare to see an inverted yield curve between short-term treasuries, ultra short-term treasuries, and corporate bonds. So why should there be a spread? Because corporate bonds are riskier, right? In corporate bonds, the default rate is relatively low, but businesses can and do get in trouble and you could have some default. You also have the p potential for getting downgraded from that AAA rating, going into AA or single A and then maybe, or high yield even. And at that point, you know, the bond price is gonna get disrupted and corporate bonds have a much higher drawdown risk than treasuries, especially short-term treasuries. So, John, do another, let's do our second chart on of the day. This is just the drawdown profile for LQD, which is a corporate bond ETF, versus BIL, which is a one to three month T bill ETF. And you can see in 2008 crisis, corporate bonds fell 17%. They fell 20% in the corona panic, and then they fell 25% last year when the Fed cut rates. So, those, those other two ones, it was relatively quick. You had this huge V down and V up. And that happened mostly because people were panic selling back then. They, they only wanted to own treasury. So corporate bonds got dinged. But this, this is the kind of thing in corporate bonds, you can get dinged like that during a financial crisis or a panic situation. So if the question is, do corporate bonds make sense right now relative to T-bills? No, they don't. The yields are higher in T-bills and you have much less volatility with for interest rates. But we don't know how this, that's short term. Short term T-bills make a lot more sense, but long term, Corporate bonds still should, if there's any relationship between risk and reward, and I think they are always attached at the hip, although sometimes they break up, they go on a break, Ross and Rachel style, they still have those friends reruns on all the time on TBS. So I just saw that we're on a break one the other day. Sometimes risk and reward go on a break, right? And don't get me in the comments here about how friends is overrated. That We had like 100 million people watching that show back in the day. I mean, hey, if, if Michael can say that Steve Carell is not funny, then anyone can say anything. You know what I mean? Nothing is properly rated in the internet era anymore. John, do another chart on here. This is my table of long-term performance of different bond yields. So we're talking long-term corporates, long-term government bonds, five-year treasuries, and three-month T-bills. And the reason I wanted to show this is because you can see the highest returning asset is corporate bonds over this period from 1934 to 2023. Next comes long-term government bonds, then five-year treasuries, then three-month T-bills. And this makes sense. And you can see the volatility kind of goes in the same order as well. I was a little surprised to see long-term government bonds more volatile than corporate bonds, but they're still in the same ballpark. So this makes sense because risk and return, especially in bonds, are attached to the hip where if you're going to earn a higher yield, you should expect a higher risk and especially higher volatility. Um, so I don't expect this current situation to last. I talk about how rare it is. This situation has basically been caused by the pandemic and government spending and the Fed. And so in the short term, things are weird and out of whack. And it seems like T-bills are, are the, the right choice to make. Over the long term, you would still expect corporate bonds to have higher long-term expected return once rates somehow normalize if there is such a thing now what are you supposed to do with that information as an investor you could just change your allocation based on the risk reward profile all the time or you could stand pat and say you know what i'm not going to try to guess i'm just going to pick an allocation and fix income that works for me and i'm going to stick with it and i think you just have to do what works for you that's kind of where i fall down on this i don't think there's one a right or wrong answer here i i have maybe a dumb question but uh a junk bond, is that always a corporate bond, or can it be like a sovereign bond of a really risky country? Is it yeah, like no, the, no, a yield are, or what? There are emerging market bonds, which could be sovereign bonds, but high yield is, is typically corporate bonds, just lower rated corporate bonds. So okay. same thing, just a higher default rate and, and much riskier companies. So perfect for my portfolio, is what you're saying? You could buy some oat milk <laughs> high yield bonds, probably. <laughs> okay, I might look for that. 
Uh, okay, up next, we have a question from Eric. One of the biggest tells for the housing bubble in the 2000s was the income to housing price relationship. I'm pretty sure Michael Lewis even wrote about this in the big short. I know the housing market is different this time around, but there is no way incomes have kept up with housing price gains, which are even bigger this time. Uh, help me understand how this is not another housing bubble. This always sends a shiver down my spine just because that was such a rough period. I graduated yes. college right in the middle of that. It was not good. I think one of the first people I ever saw write about that relationship of incomes to housing was our very own Barry Ritholtz. Let's bring him in to help out on this one. Barry, hey, you, Barry. you were hey, writing guys. about this. What, what is it? What, was it for the street.com or the big picture? One of those two. I can't remember. Uh, that it. was probably the big picture. I, I, I was writing Bailout Nation on the blog chapter by chapter. I'd throw up a couple of paragraphs. People would say, have you seen this data? What about this chart? What about this guy? And, and really, I had like a thousand co-authors, so it was really helpful. Remember back in the 2000s, the big driver of the bubble, for, first, it was really more of a mortgage bubble than a housing bubble, but the big driver was securitization. We're going to take all these mortgages and slice and dice them and, and spread out the risk. But what fed that demand, what really drove that, was all of these non-bank lenders that were popping up and writing mortgages for everybody. Remember the, the, all the nomenclature back then, the ninja loans, uh, right, no was, income, it was, it was no job, no assets. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No docs, stated income. The traditional FDIC banks weren't allowed to do that. They had to do conforming loans. But all the crazy loans, uh, the, the 228, uh, zero interest for the first two years, all that stuff came from the sort of, uh, calling it the shadow banking sector is wrong. These were just non-bank lenders. And, and when you drop lending standards to zero, well, guess what happens? You're going to give a ton of people access to capital that wouldn't have. It, it also, adding to the flame to the fire, was you, know, you had a period of, um, flat wages while everything gradually increased in price. It wasn't very inflationary, but over time it adds up. And so people hate lowering their living standards. And so people were taking HELOCs and people were refinancing or just flipping houses. And that was credit driven. When you look at today, you have two problems. One is after the financial crisis, builders just pivoted to apartments and multifamilies and underbuilt single family homes for almost a decade, depending on who you listen to, either the real estate agents or the builders association or whatever, we're two, three, four million houses short relative to how many new households and new people we have in the country. We're right, the well over 330. Of the, the irony of the last bust is that it helped create this boom essentially because they didn't build enough because everyone's so scared. The, they, the fear of the last bus sent, sent builders into apartment buildings and things like that, which, by the way, arguably, we don't have enough of those, but there's a giant shortfall. The pandemic certainly helped create. People were buying second and third homes out of their primary city. Today, you have two problems. So you have too little supply, and then making that worse is when the Fed raised rates, hey, if you have a 3.5% mortgage, uh, you're talking to the earlier question, a 3% mortgage, you're going to be really reluctant to say, I'm going to sell this and buy another house where my mortgage might be 6.5%. That, that's locking a lot of people in place. Perversely, the higher rates are causing, to some degree, higher home prices and higher rental prices. Um, it, it, it's really a challenge. The, I think the Fed has kind of raised as far as they should. Otherwise, they're making the housing situation worse. So this is a, a not so much a bubble problem or a demand-driven problem as it is a supply problem. We just need a whole lot more housing. And the other part, country. John, throw up the mortgage origination chart here by credit score. Uh, do the next one. There you go. And so this shows people taking those mortgages in 2020 and 2021 had much higher credit scores. So the people who are sitting in these houses, even if pr housing prices were to drop 10 or 20 percent like some people want to see happen, those people are still going to be able to make their their payments unless they lose their job. So that's the problem. Last time around, we saw these people who couldn't make their payments. They're having these mortgages reset higher because they took on the, the adjustable rate mortgages. This time around, it was mostly fixed rate mortgages. And so the people who have been buying homes are also much higher quality borrowers. So it's not just the lending standards. It's that the borrowers themselves are much in a much better position. Yeah, look at that light blue. Those are all your best um, 760 and up. When you go back to the 
period before the financial crisis, they're a fraction of the uh, uh, of the borrowers here. They're the vast majority of the borrowers. Yeah. So, right. It it seems like if you if if you just took prices alone and, and you you mapped them onto what happened last time around, you'd think this has to be worse because prices are up more. But it's a much different situation, and it's it's probably more frustrating for people who want to see prices crash, like Duncan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's unimaginable to to buy a home right now for for a lot of us. So, it's yeah, tough. We can we can dream. Not that we want a GFC again, but you know, prices to come down. Right. Okay. And this next question actually is someone who is thinking about buying a new house. So let's uh, let's see this one. Okay. Up next, we have a question from Zach. My wife and I do fairly well, but I'm a classic conservative planner slash spender and struggle to upgrade our life or know when it's prudent to do so. I would love to get a bigger home for our kids as they grow, but also don't want to be irresponsible. I'm 36 and make $300,000 a year. My wife is 34 and makes $85,000. We have $125,000 in brokerage slash, slash uh, savings and $400,000 in retirement. I have $750,000 in equity at work, but it's a liquid for the foreseeable future, um, three plus years, though it does pay a monthly distribution of $2,500, which we currently save. We have a modest, in, uh, modest home, 1,500 square feet with a $2,500 mortgage and about $400,000 in equity. We pay $15,000 a year for private school and would like to not be house poor. Second page. Uh, the problem is that we live in Orange County, California, and upgrading to a 2,000-square-foot pool home would be in the mid $1 million range, uh, and today's rates don't help. I'd love to keep our home and rent it, but we'd be really cash-strapped without a HELOC, and I don't think we want the headache of being a landlord. I'm completely paralyzed to make a move. My kids are 8 and 5, and I would love to give them a fun house to grow up in for the next 10 years, but I'm also trying to be responsible. I'm well aware that I'm blessed to be in this position, but it weighs on me nonetheless. Okay, so as we mentioned in the last question, this is probably the worst time ever to be a home buyer. Supp supply being low, mortgage rates being high. The good news is this person has some home equity. But as with most things, there's a, there's a trade-off, especially when you're living in California, right? So you could stay in your current house and sacrifice size, or you could move to a more expensive house and probably sacrifice some savings, or maybe move somewhere else, but then you have to give up on living in Orange County. So this is obviously more of a psychological question than it is a financial one. This person seems to be doing very well financially for someone in their mid-30s. So it's, it's really like, how do I get over that psychological hurdle of, I know that there are going to be trade-offs, and I know that whatever move I make, I'm going to have to be giving up on something. So what is that thing? So how do you think about making financial decisions when you are kind of paralyzed and you know, I have this thing tugging me this way, but this one tugging me the other direction, and I can't figure out which one is which? You, you know, you hinted at it. it. All these decisions involve two, just two simple aspects, human psychology and math. So if you're wrapped up in the psychology, do the math first, all right? They have four. First, let's get being a landlord out of the question. When, when my wife and I got married, she was living in a co-op. She moved into my apartment in the city. We were landlord for 12 years. It's a big pain in the ass. It's a job. It doesn't sound and fun you to me. Really, you know, if you're busy, if your career is throwing off that much money at a young age, focus on that, not a side hustle for this particular person of being a landlord. It's really a job, and you probably have other things you want to do um, with your time. So that's number one. Number two, the math sounds like, A, if they want to renovate their house, spend a couple hundred thousand dollars, a HELOC is a really easy way to go. They have a ton of equity. They're not going to cash-strap themselves. So, so that should be a no-brainer decision. The real question is, hey, do we want to move out of this house to something that's a million and a half, two million dollars. And that really depends on laying out a budget, looking at what you're spending, and saying, do we want to do this? It looks like they'll be able to roll a half a million dollars or so out of this house between yeah, their a down savings. Right, there. right. So in other words, it's not like they're going out and dropping, hey, I'm gonna take a seven percent two million dollar mortgage. If they move to a house that's a million and a half dollars and they're taking a, a, a million, they're putting half a million dollars down. Well, even at 6%, you know, I, it looks like 5000 a month won't make them cash poor. But they have to get past the psychology. If they feel like that's going to be too much and that's going to, then stay where you are, do a HELOC. Listen, when we moved into the house we're in now, which was a debacle and needed everything, we knew that going in, we just were very, every year we took a HELOC. 
We did a project. We'd pay it down as fast as we could. As soon as the HELOC was, you know, down to, uh, you know, around 10, 20 grand, we do the next project. And every time you need a new roof, you need new windows, you have to replace all the flooring in the house. You have to, I mean, this was a real project house. Um, the only way we could afford it was it, it probably would have been double what we paid for if it was in nice shape. And we got to do it the way we wanted to over time. So if they want to stay where they are, HELOC is really easy to do. Really, yeah, that's as why long as you manage it and you pay it down quickly. If you're in a position of already owning a home and you have equity, you're in a way better position than a first-time home buyer. Sorry, Duncan. Uh, but because you have that equity to play with where you can use it as a down payment or for the, the, new, the current house to fix it up. So I'd, I'd say, yeah, I would use that equity and then – and then you can slowly pay it off. You don't have to pay it off right away. And then you're not having to touch these other forms of income. And then if you have that equity come through from his job, that sounds like it's a ton of money, you can pay it off with that eventually. Just keep in mind, by the time they have a liquidity event for that job, typically the tide is raising all boats, and that might be sending home prices up because he won't be the only person having that windfall. So that's always the trade-off is you have to think – a couple of steps ahead. Hey, when my ship comes in, are lots of other ships coming in and the prices are going to go up? So uh, it seems crazy to think that at this hour, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be able to lock in um, $2 million as a ridiculous home price. Nobody knows what they're going to look like 10 years from now. I'm guessing California has to be the most challenging state of all in terms of making these housing decisions. Especially in areas like Silicon Valley and near LA and San Diego. There's still pockets that are less uh, expensive, but it, it, it's, it's expensive for a reason. A lot of people want to live there. Right, all right, we got one more, Duncan. Question about that real quick though. Uh, what's, what's the size square footage wise that a uh, family of four really needs, you think? It's very skewed for me in my mind because I lived in a 385 square foot place during the pandemic, so. I had a 400 square foot apartment that was essentially a fridge and a bed and a bathroom. That was way we back had a pocket in the day. door. We had a pocket door. Um, Depends if your kids are okay with uh, give them the pool. They'll, they'll probably take less square footage because that counts as part of the house in right. California. And and that's the nice thing about outdoor living is you don't need a giant house if especially in places where the weather's so nice you could be out all the time. That said, 2,000 square feet gives you a, a guest bedroom or a home office or a little breathing space. So, sometimes, if especially these days where people are working remote, kids underfoot, it, it's not easy. So you could see why there's a desire for a little more elbow space. Our right. our debate on animal spirits was what size house gives you a mansion, and we 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 landed on five thousand. So I say cut that. In That's half, my right? number five thousand. Twenty five right. twenty five hundred. Cut that in half. Twenty five hundred is probably good for a family of F four. Five thousand is just giant. And and by the that way, if huge. you wanna if you wanna live in certain areas and you don't want a giant house, you want a small house on a lake, on the water, in the mountains. Everybody is building these immense things. There's no, you know, 2,500, 3,000 square feet for a, a couple that's downsizing. The kids are out of the house. Really hard to find things like that. Yeah, unfortunately. Also, personal finance tip, give the kids the choice. Would they rather have a, a pool or go to private school? You know, <laughs> let them pick. There you go. <laughs> Set those lessons early. All right. Up next, we have a question from Cameron. What are your thoughts on what will happen to the economy when $18 billion in monthly student loan payments are turned back on? It seems as though it will significantly affect consumer spending and savings. We've got a number of questions on this. So I think it, there's something like 27 million borrowers that were part of that moratorium, put their payments on hold. The idea is those people have turned those savings into spending, right? That was a, that was a boost for a lot of people, helped them make it through. The, now it's been a couple of years, and, and it's going to be harder for those people to go back to making the payments again. And friend of the show, Sam Rowe, put together a compilation of these estimates on his Substack. Uh, JP Morgan said it's going to be like 0.1% of GDP. Goldman Sachs said like 0.2% of GDP. Uh, I, I think a couple of them said, you know, a handful. It's like a handful of basis points. Uh, sorry, not 0.2, but like 0.02. So it's, it's a handful of basis points. And John, throw up the chart here of total household debt. Total household debt's like seventeen trillion dollars. Student loan is one point six. That's pretty close to auto loans too. Mortgage debt is the big one at twelve trillion. So, student loan debt is like nine percent of of total debt. But then you also have to take the percentage of those people in student loans who are going to have trouble making the payments. Um, and I think that's where the rub comes. A lot of people think everyone's going to have trouble making those payments, and I, I don't think that that's going to necessarily be the case. So I think. 
a lot of people would like to see this be like the, an end times thing, and I think it's going to be a much smaller impact than most people assume. So, so let's put some meat on those bones. The U.S. economy is about $23.5 trillion. Two-thirds of that is consumer spending. Let's call that $15 trillion. And the question was $18 billion with a B, $18 billion a month. You're barely up to $216 billion if everybody has problems. And you know that the vast majority of these folks aren't going to have problems. So this is a rounding error. And, and this is also one of my favorite pet peeves, which is people looking at the liability side of the equation, but not looking at the asset side. What matters isn't total debt, because every year there's more people, there's more debt. Debt is always at a record. It's a, it's a scare chart. What you really want to look at is the ability uh, for individuals to service that debt. What's the ratio of total debt to discretionary income? And it plummeted following the financial crisis and then went down even more after 2020 when a lot of um, pandemic money flowed into people. Uh, so uh, I'll share that chart with you guys. It, it's really very, very manageable. Now, when it reverses, when the discretionary income to debt spikes, it's telling you people are having a harder time carrying their debt and managing it. But all these issues, it's called double entry accounting for a reason. Liabilities on this side, assets the ability, and income, the ability to pay. On the other side, if you look at one without the other, you're only getting half the picture. Yeah, your, I, I showed the, the total liabilities at $17 trillion. The Fed publishes this once a quarter. The last one they have is through March. Total assets in this country is like $141 trillion. Crazy, so, right? Giant. Absolutely, yes. uh, absolutely giant. I, I'll, I'll show, find this. It's, just look for it on Fred. Um, discretionary income to, to debt, and it's just been fall most. It's ticked up a little bit since post pandemic, but it's so far below where it was, you know, pre 2010. It's it's a different world. And I don't mean to make like uh, judgments on a big group of people, but if you have a high student loan balance, you probably haven't been a huge part of the economy anyway in terms of spending, right? And most of the people who have student loan debt are young, so they probably aren't really steering the economy as it is in terms of spending. So those people aren't going to have a really big impact either way. Except on, I'd say, a lot of independent coffee shops around big cities <laughs> are about to have a real tough time. Okay. Just, they're just there for free Wi-Fi anyway. Let's, yeah, let's that's talk, true. Uh, no, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Someone sits there for three hours, they bought a $5 coffee, and uh, right. and now they're not going to be able to pay that. That's it's, true. Um, people will find a way to manage that. I'm, I'm yes. pretty confident of that. Okay. Uh, no show next week because of the holiday. We're taking the week off. I think we do have animal spirits next week. Maybe that, is that the only thing on the compound next week? Oh no no no! We've got we've got TCAF. We've got special release on Monday actually for July fourth. Okay, so, so yeah, out. we got a lot. It's yeah. That's why we're we're not doing this though. We're not doing right. ask the compound. Yeah, good thing. Uh, thank you to Barry as always. Yeah, thanks Barry. Check out Barry at the Big Picture and at Bloomberg. You can email us ask the compound show at gmail.com if you have a question. Always, again, feel free to send us a voicemail. That was kind of fun last week. Leave us a review, subscribe, all that good stuff. Leave us a comment on YouTube, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.